Welcome to Chapter 29 of Traditions and Encounters, Revolutions and National States in the Atlantic World. This chapter talks about popular sovereignty and political upheaval. The first part of this was the Enlightenment and revolutionary ideals. A huge component of this was popular sovereignty, which was relocating sovereignty or the right to rule to the people. Traditionally, monarchs claimed a divine right to rule. They basically said a higher power had granted permission for them to rule over other people. The Enlightenment, however, challenged this right by making the monarch responsible to the people. Monarchs now had to listen to the people's demands. One important writer of this time was John Locke, and his theory of contractual government said that authority comes from the consent of the government, kind of like democracy. Another component of this was freedom and equality, which were important values of the Enlightenment. People started to demand new freedoms such as worship and expression, and they also demanded political and legal equality. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was also a famous writer at this time, wrote about this in The Social Contract. Equality, however, was not extended to women, peasants, laborers, slaves, or people of color, usually people on the lower end of the social hierarchy. However, the ideals of Enlightenment were significant and influenced many places around the globe. The Enlightenment contributed to many revolutions at this time in world history. For example, the American Revolution was one part of this. The Declaration of Independence had a huge basis and core written according to the Enlightenment, and Thomas Jefferson, the author of this document, actually took many Enlightenment ideals and put it into this document. It was signed on July 4, 1776, and with that, the 13 United States of America declared their independence from Britain. As I said before, this was heavily dictated by Locke's theory of government, how the rulers should listen to the people. The American Revolution soon followed, and after eight years, British forces surrendered, and America was granted freedom. This was really one of the first cases of enlightenment during this era, contributing to a success. Following the American Revolution was the French Revolution. Summoning the Estates General happened first. This was known as the Ancien Regime. Right before the French Revolution, the regime that ruled France was known as the Ancien Regime. And during this time, France had lots of problems. They had a financial crisis because half of government revenue went to national debt and they couldn't keep up their money to fund new things. The king at the time, Louis XVI, was forced to summon the states general to raise new taxes in order to counter their debt and expenses. However, many of these representatives didn't like the king and wanted sweeping political and social reform. So the first and second estates, which are kind of like levels in the... French ruling system at the time, these consisted of nobles and clergy, tried to limit the third estate, which were the commoners or the majority of the French men at the time. The National Assembly was formed by representatives of the third estates, so commoners together formed the National Assembly and demanded three things, a written constitution and popular sovereignty. They seized a jail called Bastille on July 14th and started insurrections. And the National Assembly also wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, kind of like the Declaration of Independence. They also adopted liberty, equality, and fraternity, which basically began and became the slogan and values for them. After the revolution, France was successful and became a constitutional monarchy. The convention replaced the National Assembly under this new constitution, but Austrian and Prussian armies, which were surrounding France at the time, invaded France to try to restore this ancien regime and try to put power back to the king. However, the convention abolished the monarchy and proclaimed France a republic as a result. Following this, the king and his queen, Queen Mary Antoinette, were executed by the famous guillotine. After they were executed, some radicals took over France, and they were known as the Jacobins. They dominated the convention and instituted a reign of terror, where many people died. However, following their rule, revolutionary changes came as well, in the French religion, dress, calendar, and even women got more rights. After this brutal time of terror came the Directory. This was from 1795 to 1799. It was a conservative reaction against the excesses or the radicalism instituted by the convention. They executed the leader, Robespierre, and they had a new constitution that tried to make France more stable. At the end of this came the reign of Napoleon, 
who was probably one of the most famous French rulers ever. Napoleon Bonaparte was a brilliant military leader, and he became a general at a very young age. He supported the revolution and even defended the directory, and he invaded many places, such as Egypt, but was defeated himself. Eventually, by 1799, he had helped overthrow the directory and named himself the consul of France for life, so he kind of became a dictator of this new republic. However, a good part of Napoleonic France was that stability finally came. He made peace with the church and also gave new freedoms of religions to Protestants and Jews, new civil codes, but at the same time, he also restricted individual freedom, especially speech and press, because he didn't want any more destruction or backlash against the French government at the time. Soon after that, he proclaimed himself emperor to try to be like more friendly, and after that, he started his conquest to dominate the European continent. He tried to invade like everywhere, and sometimes he was successful, but sometimes he wasn't. He even tried to invade Russia in 1812, and the Russian winters killed his army, basically. It destroyed his grand army. And soon after this came the fall of Napoleon. He was forced by coalitions of enemies to abdicate. He was exiled to a distant island, escaped, tried to come back to France, but was defeated by Britain. And that was the end of Napoleon. The revolution and its ideals spread beyond America and France, though. For example, it went to Haiti in the Haitian Revolution, which was the only successful slave revolt in history. Haiti was called Saint Dominique. Domingue at the time, and it was a rich French colony on Western Hispaniola, so what is modern-day Dominican Republic and Haiti. That was the island where Columbus had also first settled the New World. And this society was dominated by a small white planter class, basically the plantation owners. And 90% of the population were actually slaves who worked under brutal conditions on these plantations. Haiti also had large communities of escaped slaves, also called Maroons, and many of these free blacks had fought in the American War, brought back revolutionary ideas, and became free. Widespread discontent soon came apart because these colored people wanted political rights and slaves wanted freedom. The slave revolt soon began in 1791, almost parallel to the French Revolution, and French troops tried to stop them and other European countries tried to stop them as well, but they weren't really successful. One famous French and Haitian overthrower was Toussaint Léo Overture, and he was the son of slaves. He was literate, and he was a skilled organizer, which was sort of different for people like him at the time. He was able to build a strong and disciplined army, and soon was able to push back the French who were trying to put down the revolt. He controlled most of the island and created a constitution soon after, and he was even arrested by French troops, and unfortunately for him, he died in jail before the Republic could fully see its vision. However, the Republic of Haiti soon declared independence in that same year. Yellow fever really ravaged the French troops at the time because the French didn't really have immunity to it, and they were driven out by these slave armies. And with independence in 1803, the Republic of Haiti was established a year later. In the rest of Latin America, there were similar revolutionary ideals as well. Latin America was rigidly hierarchical. Ever since the Spanish and Portuguese came, there was a strict social class of peninsulares, which were native Europeans, creoles, which were like their children, slaves, and indigenous people, and others. The creoles sought to displace their fathers and mothers, the peninsulares, but also retained their privileged position in society. Mexican independence occurred sort of like this as well, and a peasant revolt in Mexico led by Miguel Hidalgo briefly defeated a conservative Creole force of former Spanish. From there, Mexico became a military dictatorship and then eventually a republic. However, the south of Mexico was still split and not centralized during this time. Simón Bolívar was really the person who led independence in the rest of South America. He was heavily inspired by George Washington and took arms against the Spanish, and these Creole forces were eventually able to defeat many of these Spanish armies. And his effort of creating Gran Colombia, which is basically modern-day Colombia and a bunch of cities and countries surrounding it, failed in the 1830s. 
In Brazil, Brazil, as you may remember, was actually a Portuguese colony. The Portuguese royal court fled to Rio de Janeiro because Brazil was kind of getting whack at the time. And the king's son, who was named Pedro, agreed to Brazilian independence to try to quell the revolts. Soon after, he became Emperor Pedro I in independent Brazil and reigned for many years. Creoles eventually came to dominate Latin America, although it brought little social change in Latin America because apart from the whites, the natives and the slaves were still kind of suppressed in their rights and ideologies. The principal beneficiaries as a result were Creole elites. Following this time, conservatism and liberalism emerged as well. Conservatism is basically the resistance to change, and it was an important continuity because it showed tradition about how some people still wanted to maintain the strict European traditions of sort of white supremacy. Liberalism, however, welcomed a change as an agent of progress, so progressivism. These people championed freedom, equality, democracy, and written constitutions. They wanted individual freedom and minority rights, which was a grand idea at this time. However, testing all these revolution ideas was slavery. Slavery was still seen legally at this time, but it seemed not very in line with all these enlightenment ideals. And as a result, there were many movements to end the slave trade, to fully give these natural rights to all people. It began in the 1700s and gained momentum during these revolutions. And in 1807, the British Parliament became the first to outlaw the slave trade. Other states followed suit although these slave trades continued for some time. Movements to abolish slavery continued as well. Because of property rights, slaves were really seen merely as property during this time, and the end of slavery eventually came with independence in much of Haiti and South America. In Europe and North America, the campaign to abolish slavery took a lot longer. For example, the United States took until 1865, which was the end of the Civil War, to fully abolished slavery, and Brazil finished in 1888, one of the last nations to fully abolish it. Abolition brought legal reforms for slaves, but not political equality during this time. Slaves, even though they were free, didn't always get to vote and speak their voice, as seen in America. And revolutionary ideas also dealt with women's rights. There were lots of calls for equality for men and women, because Even though patriarchy was still dominant at this time, women were taking a much larger role in society as well. One famous one was Mary Wollenscraft, who said that women possess the same natural rights as men, which was really crazy and radical at the time. In France, there was the famous Olympe de Gauges, and she declared full citizenship for women too radical and tried to scale back in some areas. So... Gauge's declaration was kind of against the feminism at this time because even though the French Revolution granted women rights of education and property, they still couldn't vote, and women didn't make a lot of gains until the late 19th century. Consolidation of national states in Europe, nations and nationalism also rose during this time. Cultural nationalism was big. It was an expression of national identity. It emphasized a common historical experience because... Folk culture and other things helped to illustrate a national spirit for people to commonly bind together with. Political nationalism was also big. This is basically when people demand loyalty and solidarity to form a national group, kind of like when people are very pro-American. However, minorities saw independence sometimes in these political national movements because they felt they weren't really represented and they wanted to form their own national community. So Independence definitely occurred after independence from other people. Zionism was a big form of Jewish nationalism, and it was in response to widespread European anti-Semitism. It was a movement founded, and they basically wanted to create a Jewish state in modern-day Palestine. Eventually, they were able to do it in 1948 after World War II. National communities also existed and grew. For example, in the Congress of Vienna, conservative leaders determined to restore the old order after Napoleon had been gotten rid of and died. And it succeeded in maintaining a balance of power in Europe for a century, sort of keeping the peace a little bit. But it wasn't able to repress nationalistic and revolutionary ideas. 
So all the different countries in Europe started ganging up against each other, which would eventually lead to war again. Nationalist rebellions also went out against the older order. New nationalists in different countries rebelled against their former rulers. For example, the Greek rebelled against the Ottomans, and France, Spain, Portugal, and other German states went against their former rulers. These conservative governments usually restored afterward, so these revolts weren't always successful, but the ideals of enlightenment still persisted. In Italy and Germany, this was very evident. So in Italy, Cavour and Garibaldi were able to inspire uprisings against foreign rule in Italy. Italy was ruled by other people at this time. They led nationalists and expelled the Austrians in northern Italy. Garibaldi himself controlled southern Italy and returned it to the king, sort of an Italian nationalism during this time. Prussia, which is really just modern-day Germany. The Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck created a united Germany. This is the rise of Germany as well. In Germany, these nationalist rebellions were repressed as well, but Bismarck was able to provoke wars to swell German pride and make Germans more happy for their state. Bismarck himself is a really well-known leader because in addition to uniting Germany, he helped to institute many reforms that would be carried out later in world history and is still present today. The Prussian king was eventually proclaimed emperor and helped to lead Germany all the way into the 1900s. So in conclusion, this has been chapter 29 of Traditions and Encounters, Revolutions and National States in the Atlantic World, talking all about enlightenment and the rise of different countries in Europe and America. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.